right, so good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all our viewers, wherever you are in the world. Hope all of you are doing well. My name is Eric Barsatan, and I'm with the Knights of Rizal Aloha chapter, and I will be your MC for today's event. On behalf of the officers and members of the Knights of Rizal Aloha chapter, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the eighth lecture in our Rizalian lecture series. The main obje objective of the Knights of Rizal is to educate people on the life, works, and ideas of our national hero, Dr. Jose P. Rizal. And this lecture series is one way by which our chapter endeavors to help achieve this aim. Before we proceed, I would like to remind our participants that the lecture will be for 30 to 45 minutes and will immediately followed by a five to 10 minute reaction from our reactor. There will be a Q&A session after the reaction. For the Q&A portion, you can write down questions uh, and put them in the chat box, but make sure you identify yourself or you can ask them directly. We will then read the written questions first before we entertain live questions. At this time, I'd like to remind everybody to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. I now call on Sir Dr. Waylon Quintero, Knights of Rizal, to introduce our guest lecturer. On behalf of the Knights of Rizal, Aloha Chapter, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Eva Washburn Repolo is an associate professor at Shamanad University, Honolulu, Hawaii. She received her bachelor's degree in speech and theater arts, as well as her master's degree in literature from Siliman University in the Philippines. Dr. Repolo also obtained her master's degree in reading from Southern Connecticut State University and her doctoral degree from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She has written and directed three documentaries focused on the values of multicultural selves in a diverse learning environment. Dr. Repolo also contributed a chapter on multilingualism, whiteness and the anxieties of whiteness, and the sociological environmental dimension of development in the book titled Whiteness Interrogated. She currently serves as a commissioner on the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, and the title of her presentation today is Femininity in Rizal's Writings. All yours, Dr. Ripolo. Thank you very much, Waylon. Um, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Happy weekend to everyone who's listening. Today, I'm going to talk about femininity in Jose Rizal's writings. And I am using No Limitang El Filibusterismo and the letters to the young women of Malolos. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this novel, just a quick overview that this novel by Jose Rizal, written in 1887, paved the way for the Filipino revolution against Spain after almost 400 years of occupation. This novel, which ignited rebellion against the Spanish, has many characters. It describes the inequities of the friars under the Spanish colonization and the ruling government. Excerpts will also be taken from El Filibusterismo, the sequel, where the lead character Ibarra has changed his identity to Simon, darker in his themes of revenge from the revelations of corruption, where, you know, Noli Metangeri was a bit romantic with Ibarra and Maria Clara um, as lead characters. The Fili signifies a more violent resolve towards the country's corruption and abuses of government. I'm also taking from the letter to the young women of Malolos, this letter from Rizal to the women seeking to be given an education like the men uh, wanting to be afforded in their, uh, their own education, where he, Jose Rizal, writes a few guidelines, which I think illuminates the concept of femininity. So I'm going to share my screen. So this was my, my, my abstract that I submitted to the Knights of Rizal. And I'm going to break this down into different parts, uh, really 
talking about the communal sociological context that became the fertile ground for the materials used by Jose Rizal in his storytelling. I will also be uh, talking about femininity in terms of uh, texts from the three different sources. There are many more in all of his writings, but I'm hoping that the few examples that I am using today will cover our time and will help me. Uh, and I hope we have enough time to really discuss the interpretations. So first let's talk about the lens of femininity as a cultural pattern. Um, I did my PhD in um, curriculum and pedagogy, specializing in cultural interpretations. Uh, when we teach literature to our students or when we tell stories, we're always looking at it from the lens of our own cultures. And um, I'm basing this on a cultural pattern called femininity developed by Gerd Hofstede, which values femininity as a trait that stresses nurturing behaviors, which is a feminine worldview that maintains that men need not to be assertive, assertive here used as aggressive, and that they can assume nurturing roles. In a feminine society, the genders are emotionally closer, compete, competing is not so openly endorsed, and there is sympathy for the underdog. Now, this is a concept that was uh, also enhanced by Adler and Gun Gunderson when they wanted to add that this dimension could also use the term quality of life to capture the, the dimension that femininity encompasses. I'm using this cultural pattern to uh, evaluate Jose Rizal's writing, trying to prove that Rizal's writing contains the cultural value of femininity. Now these taxonomies are, are no means a generalization of all its members. When we say a culture has feminine cultural patterns, that doesn't mean that some of its members do not adhere to masculinity, which is also part of Gert Hosted's study about the cultural pattern of masculinity. So let's talk a little bit further about this uh, patterns based on this differentiation, differentiations. Um, because here, the, a, a very, uh, number one, it is emphasized that femininity has a minimum emotional and social role differentiation between the genders. And that this is not just focused on women, but that men and women can be both modest and caring. The names are derived from the feminine and masculine identifications. I also want to talk about feminism quite uh, a little quickly here before we move on, because we have all understood, uh, hopefully, uh, in some in some at some level feminist movements and campaigns for women's rights, including the right to vote, equal pay, gender equity, and equal rights in the workplace, and, in gar and women garnering political positions. We also understand feminism from various points of view, including the societal changes that we have experienced, like teaching uh, gender neutral language and um, the fight for reproductive rights, all the way to the Me Too movement. Um, we're, we can talk about that after, uh, towards the end of my talk and during the question and answer portion. But here in this talk, the cultural pattern of femininity uh, emerged from a research that examined similar societal characteristics that are derived from a group's shared values and beliefs. Some similarities with feminist movements can be uh, understood in this dimension, in this cultural pattern. And based on the book, Communication Between Cultures, cultural pattern means our culturally based beliefs, values and attitudes and behaviors shared by members of a particular culture. I am asserting here that the writings of Jose Rizal exhibited the cultural pattern of femininity. So, my, my first contention is Jose Rizal is at once gossipy, but at the same time, intellectual and artistic. And it, it, it makes us want to read him. It makes us, his audience actually can actually identify with him. 
I will start with Doña Victorina from page 281 of the Noli Metangere. I wrote about um, Doña Victorina for a presentation at Oxford University in England uh, for the conference uh, entitled White Anxieties. I was very interested about the way Filipinos judge each other based on their skin color. Um, I told stories about growing up with my cousins who had, who had either whiter skin than me or who had darker skin from me and how we were treated. And I understood and about status and opportunities that were tied to the skin color. These perspectives were born out of colonialism and and is I'm sharing it here as part of what I'm trying to show uh, how Jose Rizal writes from that cultural pattern of femininity. For this particular example, I'm really talking about how Jose Rizal can capture how the community understands um, the, the details that he adds into his storytelling. So this is the book where this particular paper of mine was, was, was um, published. And it's talking about, uh, and I titled this The Unquiet, uh, per, the Unquiet Complexion. This particular section that I am quoting here describes the character that reveals the different anxieties of Filipino mestizas in the 19th century. Mestizas being half breeds that are deemed more attractive when they have whiter skin in the Filipino colonial mindset. A scene in the novel where she covers her face with rice powder to make it whiter is repeated five times throughout the the chapter. In one instance, the, the new husband waited to find courage to tell his wife that, that the rice powder made her look fake. This, along with we wearing an ill-fitting European costume, this was all done to prove to the natives that she was not one of them. The efforts towards this whiter complexions confirm the labor required to acquire a sense of worth. And it's really told in a like an onlooker, like you are in a town and you are really, he describes in his no novel, this scene where she's walking by and everybody's talking about her. So this struggle to assert pride in our complexion to proclaim a self with dark skin or unquiet complexion is the struggle for power and acceptance. The character is designed by Jose Rizal to show the ways the community observe and are affected by, by being oppressed by these feelings. Since the dominant white culture have power, women and men know about the secrets and the laughable desperation of putting rice powder on one's face. All of these um, perform to avoid the pain of rejection and therefore failure possibly in life. A an interesting material detail here that I want to point out is Rizal uses the rice powder. This is not just a secret that cannot be easily shared because women who cook and care for their families use and know the ways rice are used at home. So every it's kind of gossipy because people actually know that this is being done, that this is being practiced. And this woman of high stature is trying to cover her, her skin with rice powder. Now, this kind of storytelling that Rizal uh, shows, I mean, skillfully, is also using the knowledge that is used in nurturing practices, rice being a staple and being part of how we survive. Also, the way he talks about it, caring about one, how one presents or misrepresents herself is an act of communion. Um, Gossip is so juicy, and at the same time, it's a controlling factor in, in uh, social relationships. The perspective is obviously called by the storyteller from this interrelationships. If he wasn't a keen insider, and Jose Rizal truly was not acting like he was above the, the mass of oppressed and poor people, he was truly an insider based on how he writes these things, an insider of a community that understands the ways women and men 
and men care and nurture. This image would not have been used or not have been possible if Jose Rizal did not hold that quality of femininity where he can observe with a wide empathetic lens, a spectrum where he can use language movement and color using language that is easily identified by the community and, and it connects to his audience. And that's why the Noli was very powerful. So the next, the next excerpt that I, um, I chose is the dinner at Capitan Tiago's. And a lot of us um, have probably read this because these are the first few chapters of the Noli. If you revisit the Noli, it's something you read once again. And all our memories of big parties in our own homes, you know, um, copy these very scenarios, whoever is there, who, where people are sitting, who arrives, what they're wearing, how people talk about them, you know, measures the importance of the characters. So in the Noli, the dinner at Capitan Tiago's home uh, is actually used by Rizal to lay out his main characters. Like many communal events in, in cultures where food, family, and celebrations are valued events, the way people sit or where they sit is very important. It uh, tells us the measure of their character. So here is an excerpt when Ibarra says, what's this? Aren't you joining us, Don Santiago? Uh, but all the seats had already been taken. Lucullus does not eat in the house of Lucullus. You know, this is uh, ref in reference to our European story about uh, eating alone and whether you should eat well just because you're the one, you're the only one eating alone. But Rizal always likes to do that within in the novel, showing all his knowledges, you know, of the li European literature. But anyway, it continues to. No, no, stay where you are, don't get up, he said, his hand firmly on the young man's shoulder. I'm giving this dinner partly party precisely in Thanksgiving for your safe arrival. So he calls out, hey there, tell them to serve that tinola. And he added to Ibarra, I ordered tinola tonight for you. I'm sure you haven't had it for a long time. A great steaming tureen now made its appearance. The Dominican being at the head of the table served out the contents after murmuring grace with after murmuring grace, there was scarcely an amen from the rest. Just a quick note here at Shamanad University, if our priests pray and we don't say amen, we're also called out for it. You better say amen. <laughs> so anyway, whether by oversight or otherwise, Father Damaso's portion turned out to be composed of a lot of squash and broth with barely a chicken neck and wing, while his fellow guests were eating chicken legs and chicken breasts, and Ibarra had the luck of drawing giblets. The Franciscan seeing this mashed the squash violently, took a few spoonfuls of broth and then loudly dropped his spoon and pushed his plate away. Now, this is, this is very interesting detail because um, I'm, I'm hoping that all of us here have had experiences eating the tinola. Here, the tinola being described is the chicken tinola. For those of us who have experienced eating the tinola, Rizal refers to, we know that every part of the chicken, and I don't know, uh, depends on where you come from, maybe except for the head of the chicken, everything is actually inside the tinola, you know, and it's added to the boil. But what is quite gossipy here and quite communally known by the public or the mass of people, he's almost whispering outside of the house to tell the townspeople, look what happened. Um, you know, Padre, Padre Damaso did not get the best chicken uh, parts, you know, he, 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 he just got the neck and the wing, you know, and, and that particular detail comes from a Jose Rizal, a writer, a storyteller, who knows as an insider how people actually live, how they, they give each other this, you know, a little bit of business, giving them messages like this, telling them why they don't like them by not giving them the best parts of the tinola. What is significant here is going back to our concept of feminism is the text takes on the perspective of the members of the culture, especially in the context of the oppressed, where it, but yet it also 
talks about the act of cooking and feeding and eating, which are all nurturing and caring ways of doing. But inside this, this perspective, Rizal was able to show the character of Father Damaso. So another, another excerpt is from the bank, the banquet. Uh, I think this is page 198 and 199. Just a, a little st storytelling in the neighborhood between, between the members of the community. It's, it doesn't seem like a big um, plot you know, arc in the novel, but here you see Petra, the woman, expressing her ambitions for um, her dreams to, to, for her son to become a Pope. We can see, uh, I picked this to show that in many parts of the writing, the women exhibit analytical and persuasive skills for the growth and development of their children. Then we go just right after that page. This is a continuation of that last line. Petra expresses her dreams for her son to become a Pope. A significant detail here is when he reassures the grandfather that Andoy, her son, won't forget the grandfather because he taught him to weave baskets. Now, here I am really very excited about baskets. I mean, I have a thousand baskets in my own house, but from the Philippines. And baskets are important in our lives, in nurturing and caring. Rizal gives us the detail of a grandfather teaching his grandson how to weave baskets. The indigeneity of this, the connection to the land and, and to nurturing is very much embedded in the, in the tool, that the vessel that we use for harvesting, for forgiving, you know, for carrying. And and as you all probably know, all these baskets have very different uh, characteristics, you know, depending on how they are used for. The functionality is dependent or needed for the survival of a culture. Intricately woven to hold produce from the farm, it signifies the tools that the community uses to serve and care for each other. The fact that the grandfather taught this young man, like I said, this is a very significant. So now going back to our cultural pattern of femininity, the details allow us to, to see more deeply the relationships of the characters. That this is not just a, a tiny story of a young man uh, wanting to be a bishop and then a pope based on her on his mother's dreams. But this there's this deeper understanding of how they live and how they relate with each other because especially because we know the significance of baskets. So I would like to um, also connect femininity and collective cultures at this point, because you can see now that the interrelationships of people and the relationships of one family to the next affects how they survive. So let's def define collectivism here um, because this is prominent in feminine societies where the views and the needs of the group are even more pronounced and valued. And these are evident in his writing where social roles and duties are defined by the in-group and individuals are emotionally dependent on the social organizations and their group membership. So I'm gonna move now, move on to the letter of result to the women of Malolos. So as you know, Jose Rizal was very excited about this when he knew about this 20 or I don't know, 24. Some of the different um, articles I've read vary in terms of the numbers, but these are women who wanted to be educated. They wanted to learn the Spanish language specifically. And he wrote them a letter with some of his own thoughts on education. So. By now, hopefully the value of femininity is hopefully seen and illustrated in the few examples that I have just um, shown. Here in this letter, also creative and supportive to the goals of these women, we see a growing need for the women to be recognized as thinkers and members of society. 
His letter is not condescending and does not address women for being women, but for wanting to become members of an intelligent and professional group. So let's read each, and I hope we focus on the meaning of femininity as a collaborative effort to raise each other up, to nurture one another, and fight for those whose voices cannot be heard. So fourth, he who loves his independence must first aid his fellow man, because he who refuses protection to others will find himself without it. The isolated rib in the buri is easily broken, but not so to the broom made of the ribs of the palm bound together. Well, as you, as you might guess right now, you might realize that I'm now very interested in the buri, you know, and the ribs of the palm bound together. Uh, Jose Rizal uses this image to, uh, to help us understand collectivism and the, the value of the communal assets to help fellow human beings. I, I, this detail here confirms to me that he gives value to the ways women care for their people as he uses the image of the isolated rib as symbolized by the buri that could be easily broken if it is not bound together. So I don't know if all of us have experienced it, but I definitely have. And I also have bought one for myself here in Honolulu. I have the broom that is bound together, many sticks of the, of the coconut fronds. And as we all know, from the way we sweep our floors with the use of the broom made out of the ribs of coconut fronds, the broom is stronger with the ribs bound together. Now using this image, imagery allows us to see how his own observation of the ways women and men keep their surroundings clean for the family and community can be used as an effective detail to bring his point across. And, and this is really, stunning because he was really always looking at how how can I get across and how do I value how people care for each other. Here, number five, if the Filipina will not change her mode of being, let her rear no more children. Let her merely give birth to them. She must cease to be the mistress of the home. Otherwise, she will unconsciously betray husband, child, native land, and all. So when we understand caring and nurturing as, as important for Jose Rizal. He also says that a woman who is ignorant and submissive and does not know how to assert herself will not, will not be a good mother or will not be a good wife or will not be a good member of his native land. And then the sixth one, all men are born equal, naked without bonds. God did not create man to be a slave, nor did he endow him with intelligence to have him hoodwinked or adorned with him with reason to have him deceived by others. It is not fatuous to refuse to worship one's equal, to cultivate one's intellect and to make use of reason in all things. Fatuous is he who makes a God of him, who makes boots of others and who strives to submit to his whims all that is reasonable and just. I, I, it's very desiderata to me, you know, that when you achieve a membership in the professional world, when you are become intelligent, you cannot look down on those who are ignorant, nor can you be haughty, you know, nor can, nor can you feel inferior and because others may have more knowledge. There is this equality from the uniqueness of your, your, of your being. That, that he really wanted these women to understand, to not have to always feel like just because you want to be a, you know, an intelligent member of society that you become better than others. So again, I, femininity is also talking about favoring the underdog and lifting those who are oppressed and showing nurturing and empathetic insider details in many of Rizal's scenarios, he chooses to bring an understanding to the experiences of those who are oppressed. Here is um, a, a summary of chapter six, where uh, we were talking about relationships and interrelationships. We're talking about Capitan Tiago here, uh, Jose Rizal talks about him being a wealthy landlord in Binondo. And he also profits from the monopoly of opium. And he also 
pays for masses, processions, and prayers. In the same vein, he spends to ingratiate himself with the government, sending gifts to officials or gratifying their desires. So regarding his past, it is revealed that he was the son of a miserly landowner who did not invest in his son's education. Capitan Tiago married Doña Pia Alba. Together, they bought land in San Diego and became friends with Padre Damaso and Don Rafael. Unable, unable to bear children, Doña Pia picked the advice of Padre Damaso to dance during the fiesta in, Uban, in Ubando. Doña Pia conceived but sank into melancholy and died of purpural fever after giving birth to Maria Clara. Aunt Isabel was interested with raising the child and Damaso stood as her godfather. And we find out that Damaso is the father of Maria Clara. And here, I, I just want to, to talk about the revelations of the interconnectedness of these characters in this summary, which shows us the intricate relationships of the people in this community. Again, he sounds like some aunt of mine who went to my house and tells me, you know this person, this is what happened to him. Do you know that he was also this and he was also that? And, and it's so juicy and it is so spot on in terms of the tone in the way he writes his, um, if you read the Nolly, uh, Rizal can be very, very um, entertaining. Knowledge of these relationships come from a perspective of one who cares about why this person is part of another person's life. I know it sounds very nosy when we are into each other's business. The communal ways of being Filipino is so about, yeah, I want to know what's happening in your family and I want to talk about it. And it is it is from the point of view of people who come from individualistic cultures, um, crossing the line of privacy, but um, in the cultures where communal uh, caring is uh, part of who we are, it is not considered being nosy at all. Uh, collectivism as a cultural pattern um, is, is explained further when societies are all often born into extended families, clans or tribes that support and protect them in exchange for their allegiance. So loyalty is uh, to a certain degree very important in collective cultures. During the Spanish colonial rule, the mixing of values and ways of being triggered a great anxiety of how people related to each other. People who were in power could decide and change the lives of power, powerless families and clans. The ways a community care and nurture for each other could be used against them or destroy the fabric of their affinities. Here, Rizal tells his readers about how people got connected to each other, opening towards more storylines that show how this, this transgressed and disrupted by disloyalty and mistrust. So the entrance of foreigners and the entrance of other ways of being actually created um, new definitions of what a family meant when the Spanish came. Now, I guess I am done with the excerpts uh, and examples that I wanted to share, but just because femininity has an opposite cultural pattern, which is masculinity. I, I would also like to talk about this in El Filibusterismo. Um, here in chapter 33 uh, summary, La Ultima Razón, Basilio having been released from prison through Simon's intercession, visits the jeweler. Basilio castigates himself for forgetting his mother and brother's misfortune and pledges to support Simon's plan for a violent revolution. Simon welcomes his support. He, reve he reveals that his plans to ignite dynamite hidden in a decorative lamp at nine in the evening during Juanito and Paulita's wedding party at the venue of which sacks of gunpowder are hidden. Simon intends to take the city after the explosion with the help of Cabezang Tales and his group of malcontents. He instructs Basilio to take charge of the appointed hour of arming anyone willing to fight from the store of rifles in Quiroga's warehouse and to put to death those unwilling to join. So when you really just even look at this text and hearing it, um, it's very violent and it's very aggressive. 
it's um, one of the examples of determined set goals to achieve success by, by way, in this case, a violent revolution. So when you think about how would women fix the, the corruption, you know, how would women have, if they were leading during this time, how would it have been, you know, uh, what could we do to, to stop a violent re revolution? So that was just an example of, um, of, of masculinity in Rizal's novels too. Although in the Noli and in the Fili, you can see him um, trying to, to find a way to not bring this violent end. In fact, after that chapter, they actually did not get that done just because they were concerned that many people in the community would die and so they 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 did not pursue the violence that would have happened so i guess i am on my last slide and i'm just going to um, summarize the, that there is femininity and a lot of femininity as the cultural pattern and results writings. That femininity as a behavior pattern exhibits sympathy for the weak and femininity as a cultural trait stresses nurturing behaviors. And results writings echo the experiences of the oppressed. Rizal as an empathetic insider shows epistemological knowledges that are shared from the point of view of the members from the community showing nurturing and caring selves. And until now, the debate over why Rizal was not, you know, Andres Bonifacio, or why he was finding ways to fix the situation during that time in ways that were uh, amicable for all the people who were there during that time, is probably a struggle that 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 was not yet ripe for women to fight for. And so I would like to um, also say that the cultural pattern of femininity looks at the sociological contexts that are more communal. And members of this culture, or in this case, Jose Rizal and the leaders and storytellers during that time found a way to effectively tell the story without leaving the masses um, positioned as outsiders, he really, really used everything he can to approximate what that life was and how people could feel that they are valued and that they could understand what he was trying to say. In some ways, the virtues of the feminist movements are encompassed by the cultural pattern of femininity. Thank you. Great. Mahalo, Dr. Rapolon, for the informative and very interesting lecture. Before I call on our reactor, I would like to remind that participants, again, that they can write questions they want to ask our lecturer in our chat room, and we'll read them after the reaction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and now I take the pleasure in introducing our reactor actor to the uh, uh, presentation. Elena Clarissa is a lifelong Philippine Studies scholar. She manages the Philippine collection at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, one of the largest Philippine collection outside of the Philippines. She also serves as the head of the Asia department at the UH Hamilton Library. Born and raised in Mindanao in California, she came to Hawaii in 2003 to learn about nonviolence education organic farming. The calling to teach at a university was hard to ignore, so Elena taught Asian studies with an emphasis on the Philippines at the University of Hawaii at Manoa before becoming a full-time research and instruct instructional librarian. She has a wide range of educational backgrounds, including biology, Asian studies, and education, where she specialized in curriculum building. She has written several interdisciplinary and Philippine-based curricula for the Polynesian Voyaging Society, Honolulu Museum of Art, and Chicago Public School System. Please welcome Elena Clarissa. Maraming salamat. Um, good evening, everyone. 
Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Eva washburn Polio, um, for that very insightful and interesting um, presentation. Um, if you can bear with me, I wrote a lot of um, a lot of insights and um, notes that I can share. Um, I hope I do justice <laughs> reacting to your um, presentation. Um, the first thing I thought about was when I heard about um, Dr. Ripolo's presentation, what I actually heard was feminism, not femininity. And even in my notes, I keep writing femininity, femininity, I mean, feminism, feminism. And then just now I changed it to femininity because it's definitely, that term is not something that many readers would associate with the Noli and its sequel, the El Fili. Um, especially since these books were banned by the Spanish authorities in the Philippines because of their allegations of corruption and abuse by the col colonial government and Catholic Church. If anything else, you would probably hear masculinity and not femininity. And so on a personal note, um, and I'll go back to this, um, I actually, I still remember when my older siblings were still in the Philippines, when they were in high school, they would come home from school quoting Noli and El Fili. They were so engrossed in it and they were excited as if they were watching a highly anticipated show. They would endlessly talk about Crisosto Ibarra, um, Maria Clara Cis and all other character, characters in Rizal's books. Perhaps, perhaps has something to do with Rizal's um, strategy of gossiping, like the way he does it. You know, he's such a good storyteller that he is because he is, as uh, Dr. Eva said, is an insider of the community, so he knows. And because of that, it engages everybody, including my, my at that time, my siblings were only 13, um, learning about El Fili and Noli. So going back to uh, when I first thought that the, um, that the presentation was about feminism, the first thing that I thought about was, was Rizal a feminist? How did he portray the women in his books? What, what did he do for me as a Filipina? I even read an article questioning the status, the status of Rizal's women in Noli, Noli and El Fili, and it says that it asserts the position of women in Rizal's eyes, even in Europe and in the United States, is one viewed through the lens of patriarchy, the lens of his time. However, the more I thought about it, and I was thinking and thinking about this the entire time, the more I reflected on Dr. Eva's talk, I honestly initially missed her point. What is different and what I appreciate about it is how she presented a different perspective in viewing Rizal's work. Um, I have to admit, I had a hard time wrapping my head around it at first, but however, but to view his work from the lens of femininity as a cultural pattern, explains why his works were very powerful. Because Rizal was able to echo the experiences of the oppressed the people's experiences at that time um, were given voice in this book. Um, and the people saw themselves in the book within each character. So Rizal, by writing um, the way, like what Dr. Ava said, he's such a good storyteller, being an insider, he was able to um, reflect what people was going through at that time. Um, by doing so, by writing his book, he was able to raise the Filipinos consciousness, perhaps and as we know, empowering them to find others who felt the same way. And those books, his books, um, helped in eventually creating a unified Filipino identity. Um, since the Filipinos or the natives at that time identified with their respective regions. Um, ultimately, it was very helpful in mobilizing, in inspiring Filipinos and Filipinas who were ready to fight against a tyrann tyrannical Spanish colonial government. In order to do something like that, for me as a former activist, you have to, when I was re reading Bulosan's book, you have to be really moved by a book to actually make you to do something. So Rizal was able to do that, inspire the people to actually raise up arms and to actually to start mobilizing. So if you look at it this way, it's easy to see why it indirectly influenced the Philippine Revolution of Independence from the Spanish Empire, even though Rizal actually advocated direct representation to the Spanish government and, and an overall larger role of the, of the Philippines within Spain's political affairs. And so going back to um, 
going back to my siblings who were very captivated, captivated by the Noli and El Fili. It's not like they were just watching K-drama or X-Files, you know, or something like that, or something, watching a show that they really enjoyed. Like, mind you, they would actually come home and just talk about this. And I was very sad that I left the Philippines before I could take those classes in the Philippines. Actually, what happened, and again, using the lens of uh, femininity, it makes sense to me now, and thank you to Dr. Ava's um, presentation. Um, what it was is that um, my siblings read the Noli during um, the Marcos regime. The reason why they were so captivated um, by by Noli's work, by Vizal's work, is is also because they were reading this during Marcos's um, during the Marcos regime where people were disappearing. You know, we were hiding, we were in Davao. It was a very scary time. Um, you would hear about, you know, people being dumped in the um, Bankerohan River. They were killed. So during that time, they were able to, um, they were able to understand the Noli even better. Um, and they perhaps realized that not much has changed since the Spanish colonial period. And I'm pretty sure, and, and at that time, they thought that the Filipinos were still not free. And whether you agree with me or not to this day, I am thinking that those Filipinos now, the Filipino students who are reading about Rizal's books could still identify with what's going on, um, with what's happening um, with the Filipinos in Rizal's time. So on that note, again, thank you so much, um, Dr. Eva for your presentation and also for um, Dr. Colmenares for inviting me to speak tonight. Thank you. Many thanks to our reactor for her insightful comments. We now start the Q&A portion. Our lecturer can start it off by responding to the comments of the reactor. Sir, Dr. Raymond Leongson, KUCR will serve as a moderator. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, thank Elena. For, for the very well um, said um, early, your early idea of how Rizal, you know, positioned women in his novel are still very valid. Yeah. And th those, are, those are things that I'm also mulling about looking at how did he develop these characters? What were the what were the contexts that he was faced with, that he had probably a few choices, um, or how, how did he put together all the stories so that he could celebrate women? And what kind of women did, did he encounter? Well, in, you know, and it, it, it was definitely a struggle for him, but femininity opens up for me a, a wider view of how he was tr really trying of how we should probably define um, feminism because it is not about women only but it's about men who will not also resolve issues by pure power and violence you know and during his time he was still inventing this he was the first person who said, how am I going to make this reality? How can I write this down and get it known? So there's not much of the rights of women being promoted, you know, in the Noli and in the Philly. And so I, I, I see that uh, from your reaction. And that is also part of how I'm looking at it. But there there is a, a way that he has written that still allows everybody to feel like they are in on it. Thank you very much, Dr. Repolio. Uh, we now welcome questions. Uh, by the way, I'm Raymond Youngson, one of the members of the uh, Knights of Rizal Aloha chapter. We now welcome questions uh, for uh, Dr. Repolio on her talk. Femininity, uh, femininity in results writings. Any questions? Raymond? Um, yes, uh, Dr. Bukoli? 
Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Eva Washburn. I'm happy that you're also from, from Dumaguete, from Siliman. And uh, we can speak Bisaya here. <laughs> Actually, uh, since you're coming from the perspective of humanities, and I'm coming from political science, probably my reading of Rizal would be along his political standpoint. But um, given the limited time that you were presenting, um, femininity as a cultural pattern in Rizal's works, do you think uh, do you think Rizal was critical of uh, femininity as it was uh, evolving, as it was existing during the time of the Spanish colonialism? As for instance, exemplified in his characters, Sisa uh, and Maria Clara, wasn't Rizal critical of um, of the notion of femininity as exemplified in the characters of Maria Clara and Sisa, for instance, who were showing the character of being submissive, being uh, victims rather than uh, rather than being empowered women. So was it Rizal critical of this notion of femininity? As seen in these two characters I have mentioned. What do you think, Eva? Um, thank you. Thank you for your question. I think that when he wrote Maria Clara, he was really seeing the tenderness and this and the kindness of women, but not the, assert the assertiveness of women. And See, that was, it's very interesting when you think about our, our times right now and how we write women characters in our stories. Because even now, women suffer from having this um, position where our own definition of what is the quality of life and how we should live with taxes, you know, apportioning healthcare or making things uh, equitable for those who have less in life, it, it's not there yet. You know, it, it's like if we ruled the world, <laughs> if femininity had room to have everybody have a better quality of life, we know that it would be different, but it's still a very difficult struggle. So what, what I'm trying to say is he was defining the women that he saw during that time, not to defend him. Um, he was he was seeing two kinds of women in, in even in the let in the letter to the young women of Malolos. He wanted women to be intelligent and assertive, but then at the same time he saw that women were submissive and shy, and and that they were they were dealing with things that were not important, especially when they talk about things that are not helpful. In, to elevate, but he did not. He not. He did not shame them. He did not shame them in his stories by saying that this is an ugly characteristic. He was describing the, a way of life. So when, when we move to Sisa, so to answer the Maria Clara question, that was the women woman that he saw, and that was the woman that he thought was probably good enough, but not enough. But with you know, but with Sisa, to me, Sisa, that my reading of Sisa has always been as a metaphor of the Philippines. Sisa becoming completely destroyed by, by her own, and she was not just a woman to me that was walking around looking for her children, becoming crazy. She was the country itself being um, accused or being made to to be, to be, to blame it on her, you know, the, the story made her, made us look like well, you don't know what's happening, you don't know how to think, you don't know how to figure this out, and that's why you go crazy, and and 
but then the, the reinterpretations of CISA in beauty competitions for talents and in short skits in elementary schools. And, oh, what will be your talent for this beauty contest? Oh, I will just be CISA. I will laugh and cry. Oh, oh, including Doña Victorina, all of these little things, little stories that became caricatured, you know, outside of the Noli really destroyed the interpretation of the Noli and what Maria Clara or Sisa actually meant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eva, for the response. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Eva. Do we have other questions? Uh, we don't seem to have. We have, we have a written question from David Foreman. OK. Please read, would you please read it uh, to us, sir, Jun? OK. Uh, David says, I am wondering about the potential for using chismis to more effectively reach modern audiences perceived as anti-intellectual. For example, supporters of Trump, if not also Duterte, who certainly are not characterized by femininity. I like the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for the question. I really think it will work. Um, even in the military, you know, the word of mouth, the buzz, the way things are being done to create a scenario, to create um, stories. Chismis is very used, used and useful. Um, the problem in the Philippines or here is we don't gather enough and we don't really trust each other enough to be in 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 the company or in mixed company. And there's also this little thing, even here in the university where we avoid talking about politics and religion, and they we are told that those types of topics are um, at our taboo, you know, and that we should not go there in mixed company because we probably don't know how to manage a difficult, rigorous exchange of ideas. But chismis actually works and it's probably also the one that is very strongly um, uh, used in the anti vaxxers uh, um, pro proliferation of, of the wrong information. Um, I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm invited in the Philippines now to talk about risk communication when infectious disease doctors are having problems communicating the risk involved in, in the pandemic. And so, but we don't know how to reach. We don't have that femininity, the insider way of being and doing and it's in the tone of our voice in the way we move our shoulders i mean you guys you probably know about this when you are in town and when you are with the with the people that there is a way of being that makes you uh, get accepted as a as an insider as a member of the crowd and the way you gossip the way you are trusted with your gossip is actually and, and who you are in terms of Oh, you know what? This is what I uh, know. This is what Raymond told me. Yeah. And, and because Raymond told me, it must be true. And, and how that is going to create a, a line of truth using, using gossip, it will really be very effective because it comes from a line of trust. Thank you very much, Dr. Eva. Uh, of course, chismis also has a, a social function, and that's what you said, it could be useful. Uh, there was one statement that uh, uh, Dr. Rapoli mentioned about, uh, uh, about men and uh, women, uh, men, women and men's propensity for, for violence. So to your mind, how would women stop or maybe temper the propensity of men's uh, violence or particularly in, uh, let's say, 
of violence or um, I mean, uh, revolution, um, uh, violent revolution, violent change. So again, how would women stop or temper men's propensity for violence? Thank you, Raymond. I, I, I think that um, in the femininity cultural pattern, men and women can have femininity as part of who they are. So there are men who are who hold the value of femininity. And there are women who hold the value of masculinity. I must admit that growing up with a father who's a lawyer a fa and with six brothers, with, with grandfathers who had, you know, who owned cockpits in my own hometown, I was really brought up with a very mass, the, the masculinity, you know, um, cultural pattern. I am ambitious, I am driven, I work hard, and I think I shoot for the kill until I got acquainted with my mother, you know, until I gave up on all of these things and I did not want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a teacher. Sorry for those of you who are in the masculinity thread. It doesn't mean that women, I have a very masculine um, pattern inside of me. It was how I was brought up and it was how I was taught to succeed, you know. Um, so to to answer the question, how could I stop violence as the only resort to solve a problem? You know, we need a lot of men and women who have more of this um, nurturing and caring self. And it begins with our understanding of who our neighbors are and how we can um, share our, our assets, I guess, you know, how, to, to let, to not be greedy, to not have, enormous homes with with cars that you don't need you know all of these um sharing of our vegetables and and teaching without having to teaching your neighbor be, make your young neighbor your apprentice going back to a time when we all shared our our goods and and not moving towards this capitalistic system where we are all trying to say somebody has to be number one and number two is less than number one, you know, as, as if the, num the number two never worked so hard, you know, the football games, basketball games, uh, Rafa versus, you know, you know, tennis, all kinds of competitions that are embedded in this capitalistic system are all very driven by what I grew up with because I always wanted to be number one and that is killing me, you know, and that, and, and I'd rather give up on everything and just go home and plant a garden. That, that that's, that's a crazy answer, but yes, that is how I would move towards more feminine ways of being. Raymond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulia. Yes, Dr. Buckley. I joined the conversation on femininity and masculinity. I share the view of Eva that uh, in our context, which is basically very patriarchal and uh, capitalist dominated system, uh, we are put into a binary, binary of masculinity and femininity. And oftentimes the positive values of strength, power, uh, being always ahead, being always at the top, becoming professor emeritae, etc. Struggling in the world which defines success in terms of publish or perish. These are all part of a masculine world in the academia. So that's the world we live in. And basically I share the view of Dr. Eva that uh, we, we question the idea that all nurturing characteristics, all uh, peaceful oriented characteristics are feminine and that which is aggressive that is for violence that is for war it's masculine so we, we question this kind of binaries that puts more importance and value to what we say as masculine traits and masculine character and part of society's notion of masculine character is uh, violence like violence against women and children and, and it's often perpetuated by men 
because they are they are they are uh, socialized into aggressive and masculine and misogynist values even when they're young and that would explain why um, violence are, are often attributed as violence and aggressiveness are often attributed as masculine traits but um, I also share the view that violence in a way or in the context of Rizal we go back to Rizal as he portrayed in uh, the characters of Simon and Ibarra Rizal at the other novel, at the sequel to Noli, uh, tended to being open to violence. And uh, when we say violence, we say it's it's the it's the aggressive way of uh, seizing power. And for us Filipinos, in the context of Rizal and the other heroes of the Philippine Revolution, we accept that violence in that particular context was needed, was the necessary means to, uh, to achieve independence. So in that particular context, we qualify that the use of force, uh, the use of arms with the failure of the propaganda movement of Rizal was necessitated by the continuing oppression that was experienced by the Filipinos at the time. So in that particular context, uh, violence, taking violent action is a legitimate action of uh, oppressed peoples. Okay, that's, so in that particular, I, I qualify my, my reading of my response to violence because uh, the use of um, militant or more revolutionary way is, accept is acceptable in the context of Rizal to end the years of oppression and uh, marginalization of the Filipinos. So that's what. Yeah. Okay. I, I, also, I just want to add that the structures that are built by the masculinity pattern are still there. So yeah. even if we put all women in the legislature, in the Senate, but the system is still masculine, the laws are still about funding given to more. Uh, my budgeting more for wars and jets, you know, fighter planes and all of those, then there's really, even if we are all dressed up in women's clothing there, we're still following a structure that cannot be feminist, feminicized, you know. So it's, it's a big overhaul. And going back to David's question, the chismis cannot even travel because there are barriers for these um, line of exchanges that does not allow people to exchange ideas in ways that can be verified, especially with the social media situation right now. So there's um, an, an entire way of, it, it's kind of not, it's always kind of frowned upon when we become a little more emotional and a little more caring and a little bit more nurturing, but that is really what is needed, including how the earth should be loved and how plants and animals should be part of our identity. Yeah. I may add, thank you. Thank you, Eva, for that very, very good point. The, the need to transform a system that uh, is anchored on a very aggressive, uh, what we call toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity, which uh, puts in, uh, uh, defines maleness in terms of being aggressive, violent, and uh, overpowering. And so I agree with you, the need, part of the transformative agenda, which Rizal um, mentioned in, uh, in all his works, is the need for, what you said, nurturing and caring society. And the value of caring, being caring and nurturing is not mainly feminine values, but I think these are uh, shared values, whether you are male, female, or lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, plus, plus. And so uh, essentially, uh, hopefully in my October 24 paper or discussion, I would say conversation, I could add more on the, the our reading of Rizal using a post-colonial 
uh, perspective in the context of a developing country like the Philippines. So very interesting. Uh, teaching people not to be violent is a very important uh, agenda that I think we should pursue in the context of a very, very violent world, which, which uh, mutes the voices of women in Rizal's novel, like Sisa, Maria Clara, or Huli. Huli was pambayad utang to, uh, by his parents, by her parents. Very interesting, using Rizal, we can uh, move forward and maybe contribute. Rizal, if I may add, was talking about uh, equality and inclusivity, the notion of inclusivity, which is a very popular notion even at the global arena in the United Nations and in the where all countries are asked to contribute towards achieving the sustainable development goals and the very core value there is inclusivity. And in the context of Rizal's novel, uh, there was no inclusivity. There was no shared prosperity. It was frailocracia, the dominance of the friars and the, the Spanish colonizers over the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bokoy. Um, uh, we would like to have more questions if uh, we do. Otherwise, uh, we would like to remind you that our, for those who are interested to receive certificates of attendance for this lecture, uh, you can send a letter requesting for, for the same to our chapter commander, Sir June Calmenares. Uh, so do we have more questions? Uh, if not, I would bring you back to our MC, Sir Eric Barsakan. Thank you very much, Sir June. I'm Sir Raymond Leongson. Well, it has been a lively exchange of ideas um, and a productive discussion. I would like to once again thank you, our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Eva Washburn Rapolio, and our equally distinguished reactor, Elena Clarissa, for this very interesting educational exercise. I would also like to thank our viewers for their participation in this virtual lecture. It is our hope that this lecture has given us a better understanding of who our national hero is. So this ends our eighth lecture in the Resilient Lecture Series sponsored by the Knights of Rizal Aloha Chapter here in Hawaii. Tune in for the next Zoom lecture, which will be on October 23rd. So it's gonna be next month. So October 23rd at 5 p.m. Hawaii time or Philippine time, uh, 11 a.m. the following day, October 24th. Dr. Rodora Bukoy, uh, retired professor at the University of Hawaii, I'm sorry, University of the Philippines, Cebu, and former chair of Philippine Commission on Women will be our next lecturer. Uh, he also saw her, saw her today. Uh, she, she provided her thoughts and ideas. So Dr. Bukoy will talk on the topic, revisiting results ideas on the woman question. We hope to see all of you next month. Until then, mahalo and aloha. Stay, stay safe and take care, everyone.